So welcome everybody. Again, Steve Cady here, and I'm at Bowling Green State University, and we are addressing the third part of a series in the art of conceptualization and building models that work. And the whole notion of models that work focuses on we want to, we have all of us have great ideas. A lot of you are doing some amazing work in the world, doing things that you really love. And you're looking for ways, creative ways to take what you know, take that intellectual property, if you will, that intellect, those intellectual concepts and models and, and put them together into a framework that is accessible to others. And the idea is if you can take what you care about, translate it into a model framework that is accessible to others so that they can then use it and you can make it scalable so many people can use it. That's really what is great about the art of conceptualization. And what separates the, the people that create models that have what I call legs versus those that don't is people that are able to create a model that others can understand that is accessible, that can then use it and multiple people can use it, i.e. making it scalable, thus creating a community of practice around your framework. And over the last 20 years, I've had the pleasure of working with and learning from and studying some of the best model creators out there in the world who have created frameworks, who have then turned those frameworks into useful tools that other people can adopt, use, and teach others to use, hence building that community of practice around their work and then making a bigger difference in the world around what they care about. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, so. As I've mentioned, we're going to look at these possibilities about taking our ideas and taking them out into the world. And we're going to look at the elements of visual models. We're going to just explore different types of models. I've got all kinds of cool examples to give you. You're, if you're thinking of your idea and you're thinking, how do I get this idea so that people can understand it? And today we're going to focus on the visual piece. And what are all the visual options you have for your model, for your framework, for your tool? for your intellectual concept that you want to then turn it and concretize it so that other people can understand it, use it, and scale it, and build a community of practice. How do you, how do you, what are all the different visual options that you have? And we're going to look at, and, and when I talk about the bottom line of visual learning, we really want to kind of make sure that we're using all of the different tools to give you a nice diversity set of tools. And the bottom line here, is that you're, you want to create visuals with intention, visuals that serve a purpose within the context of your model. You don't create visuals just for the heck of it. They serve a purpose to help you, again, make your idea accessible so that people can duplicate it, so that people can then teach others, so that you can then build a community of practice. As I mentioned, what intrigues you about today? So in the chat room out there, and John, I'm going to ask you to, cut a, uh, to take a look in chat land and tell me what's out there. And you can tell me what intrigues you about today as well, John. What intrigues you about today's session and what questions do you bring today? Great. Um, there is some activity in the chat room and I'll just go through some of the comments first and then there are a couple questions. Um, so Sherry uh, loves visual expression, um, left brain versus right brain. Uh, Deb said she's here to expand uh, her knowledge and applications for the work that she does. That's why she's here. Uh, Judson uh, was intrigued by the possibilities for making the models that they use more visual, finding the perfect graphic to evoke emotions and show meaning. Um, Deb also said we make models all the time, just like airplanes. And then there are two questions. One is from Dave. It says, are there concepts or abstract ideas that are best suited for modeling? And are there some that are not great model candidates? And then the other question is, is it recommended to trademark a model somehow before sharing publicly? And that's from Joe DeWolf. Cool. Two good questions. Can you repeat that first question? I'll, I'll jump into the two questions right off the bat, and then we'll kind of, and then maybe there'll be appropriate times to come back to it as we're going through it. But can you state the yep. first question again? Yep. And are there concepts or abstract ideas that are best suited for modeling? Are there some that are not great model candidates in terms yes. of concept direct idea? Very simply, if a concept has no intention behind it, then it's not a candidate for modeling. If you have a concept that you have intention behind, which means you have some purpose, some desire to do something with it for yourself, 
or for others, and there's intention behind it, and you have something you care about that has intention, then there, it, it's a, always a candidate for modeling. And it can be for yourself or others. You might create a little model, a little symbol, a little something that represents something just to you. And when you see it, it does what it does for you, what your intention is for yourself. Then if it's something that you have an idea or something for other people, then it's obviously a candidate for modeling because modeling is all about helping you take what you know, take an idea and communicate it to others in a way to achieve some purpose, some intention for yourself or for others. So if you have no intention behind it, then there is no candidate. Otherwise, everything's a candidate for modeling. Um, and then the second Steve. question, what is that? What was the second question, John? Uh, it says, are there some are there some concepts or ideas that are not great candidates for models? So you answered that one, but Dutch has a question, and I think you just started to touch on it. Um, it's what what is the difference between intention and purpose when you're thinking about um, concepts being best suited for modeling? Um, I would say the, the only difference between the two is in level of clarity, uh, but I, I think you could even argue that they're synonymous. So intention um, is purpose is intention intention um, verbalized is intention expressed so uh, intention is something that you intend to do something that you care about something you want to see happen in the world uh, so that is this notion of intend for it's kind of a, got a cause and effect notion to it and I think purpose is is taking intention clarifying it more and giving some uh, words to it or giving some expression to it. I think they're both the same thing. Maybe just one is more specific than the other. And I could even argue that they're both synonymous. And what's the other one, John? Actually, you, you, you answered that question. Um, the other one was uh, you talked about the concepts and ideas that are best suited for modeling. Maybe talk a little bit about one concepts that are not great model candidates, but I think you did that. In yeah, I did that already. There was another question. I already said, I already addressed that. So it yeah, was you, by uh, Jeff DeWolf, I think you said. Oh, it was, uh, is it recommended to trademark a model somehow before sharing it publicly? The, um, I've done a little bit of research on this and you can look at intellectual property now because there's a lot of trademarking of intellectual concepts. And particularly with um, with that, there is a timetable from the minute something gets introduced. If you copyright it and it's documented, that's published. I think there there is something to be said for not sharing it. And you can and you can read out uh, out in the literature and in the law that there is some timetable from the minute that people begin to be aware of your idea. You have a certain time limit by which that minute it goes out that you have to um, then formalize it in a trademark process. And I think it's something like uh, one to two, I think it's two years. Um, I'd have to go back and look and you can look that up. So John, are there, is there anything else out there in chat land to chat, to talk about before we move on? No, that's it. Okay, so for everybody out there, I'm just gonna uh, whiz through, fly through, uh, these these the front end slides because we've already talked about it the, in part number one we discussed uh, what is what are models and ge generic versus applied then we went into looking at the notion of verbal persuasion and we're now getting into visual communication and so this is just giving you a sense in, in, in the previous slides and you'll be able to go look at our recordings to see where, and, and, and review these recordings of why we build models the foundation, what is generic versus applied, uh, this real notion of induction to deduction, which I think is such an important point, knowing that you know how you create your model is not how you describe your model. And I wanna always emphasize that, that the, that the experience, the life journey that you went through to create your model, you, you, you end up with your model, you then describe it in reverse, present your model and then take it apart. And that's such an important point as you go, we talked about the three V's in any type of, of, of expression of your models, you're going to have this notion, and this goes back to self-efficacy and forms of learning, but there's verbal, visual, and visceral. 
And we're right now going to be focusing on the visual. And there's always this notion of physiological arousal that's connected to the three Vs. And the more you have physiological arousal, the more you know that you're connecting with people and they're feeling it in their bones, so to speak. So we talked and went through the forms of verbal persuasion and different types of question, uh, uh, sentences and structuring and definitions and, and so forth. And we talked a lot about how to apply it and those kinds of things. And now we're at visual. And we're at visual communication, visual learning, um, and or vicarious learning, as, you, as uh, Bandura states from his work in self-efficacy. And so as we look at visual, I would like to take you through a variety of models. And what I've done is I've you can break them down into these four areas. And I have just in the last hour been playing, last couple hours today, have been playing with a couple other frameworks that I've woven into these four. So you've got content models, you've got Gutman skills, you've got predictive models and process models. We also got a few others that I'm going to bring in, instructive models to all kinds of other things. So what I'd like to do is take you through this the process here. And, and what I wanted to say and begin with is the bottom line. Um, you want to use visuals to bring words to life. And the words and documents describe the visuals in a way that you can see the visual. And the visual serves the words in a way that makes the ideas accessible. So here's, here's the idea. Here's the notion. A lot of times people create a visual, they drop it in, and they start, they, and they have a, and they don't really connect the words to the, to the model. I think you want to make sure that as you have your text and your text is being used you want to cue people in your writing to the visual you want to tell them either in parentheses go see figure one or see whatever and then you want to describe it and there's two ways to describe the visual one is just to explicitly describe all the pieces of it the other is to refer to it or to elaborate on it and to describe to people how to use it how to understand it and so forth so a lot of times what you have to do when you have your visuals is you're describing your concept, you introduce your visual, you give them a framework for how to, how to review it, give them instructions on how to uh, read or view the visual, and then based on the type of visual, because it's using the visual to complement your concept. So as we go through Gutman scales or process models or those kinds of things, you're gonna see that you utilize them with intention to support what you're trying to convey to the reader. So with that, there's this notion that a picture is worth a thousand words and a metaphor is worth a thousand pictures. And a visual metaphor is worth a whole lot more than that. And we're going to be talking about that as we go through how do we connect words to the visuals to, to even these, these much more in-depth ways of thinking about concepts like metaphor or visual metaphors. Let's begin with the first area, content models. Now, content models simply are, as you, as you start working on your framework, your methodology, your model, it's going to have buckets, as I call them. And so before you worry about uh, how to relate them to each other, what visual, you really first are starting with just what are the main buckets, and you keep working on your buckets. Now, some people will try to work an acronym and force the buckets into an acronym. And it's very interesting, because I have done that quite a bit in terms of having acronyms that say something. You know, like I've got the diet for action research or, you know, some other models along those lines. And when you force it, sometimes what happens is you end up undermining your ability to express your idea. So you've got to let go of it. So, for example, I have another another concept called plan for project management. And it stands for purpose, leadership, actions and needs. Before that, I had this concept called PODER, P-O-D-E-R. And it was purpose, outcomes, design, evaluation, and so forth. And the interesting thing is I use that in, in practice. I use that in my classes. I use that with consultant in consulting projects. And I was working on a major project down in Lake Nona. And I was working with the president down there. And we were poterizing. And I love the term poter and poterize and all that kind of stuff. And the guy finally stopped and said, I hate that. I hate poterizing. It's driving me crazy. So I had to go back to the drawing board. And what was interesting was I, I had forced this notion of poter onto myself. And then eventually uh, it, you know, it blew up on me. And so then from there, I went back to the drawing board and out, out came this notion of plan, P-L-A-N for project management and planning. 
I didn't force it, but it kind of came out. So you'd be surprised if you can let go of needing to force your content into buckets. Let your buckets form, begin to drop the content in your writing into each of the bucket areas. If it's not flowing, if it's not getting in symmetry, or if it is in symmetry, but you're stuck, let go, rip off the paper, start over again, do different things. But again, content models are, are where you tend to start, and that is your buckets. Now, there are different ways to have your content models relate to each other. So, for example, a Venn diagram. Now, in a Venn diagram, and I'll be curious out there in chat, chat land, so if you all could look at this, I'd like to get some answers from you all out there. And that is, I keep getting my email, but i got to close my email. So, you all, forgive me for this. I'm going to drop out here. This was supposed to have been closed. Quit. Back and present. All right. So with the Venn diagram, what I'm what I'm interested in here with you all is when you when you have culture and people, what do you call that? We have culture and processes overlapping. What do you call that? When you have processes and people overlapping, what do you call that? And what do you call it when you overlap all three? So I'm curious out there, what do you what, what would you all call that? Culture overlapping with people. Culture overlapping with process. Process overlapping with people. What do you call it when all three overlap? Now, there is a term for that. And what I want to tell you is here is that these overlaps are called system states. And that is when you take two concepts, a concept here and a concept here, and you overlap they create a they, these two concepts create a third concept together. So when they overlap and create a new concept that you name in this area or in this area or in this area, and one of the three areas, culture, people, culture, process, process, people, when you have those two overlap, that's called a system state. And, and that's got a new term of its own. So a lot of times you can take your concepts and create new concepts that are at a higher level when you, when you combine the two. In this case, I'm curious out there, John, has anybody taken a stab at what they would call one of these three things or four? No, not yet. So I'm going to wait for you all. I'm going to come back to that and see if somebody does. As long as somebody takes a stab at it, I'll come back to it and, and tell you what this is. And the second thing down here is this link here. There are lots of diagram makers. Down here, you can see what's called lucidart.com. If you go to lucidart.com, they actually have Venn diagram generators and they have other types of model generators. And again, what you're trying to do here is there's a reason for having three concepts and, though, and making a point. Your point, going back to the notion of intention, is that when the three overlap, they make a, another concept. And that helps people to understand that they are all interrelated. And sometimes it's important that two might be related to the other. So two might be related and the other two might be related, as we talked about. So another way of thinking about content models is like principles or guidelines. So in your model, you're going to have some guidelines, some general rules of thumb, some things you want people to be mindful of, some tips or whatever, whatever you might have. And what you might do is you might create these as a list. So sometimes a, look, guidelines can be presented as a list. Now, visually, it could be presented as one, two, three, four, five. You might remember we talked about this here, a listing at one, two, and three in no particular order. You might go a step further and start building on this notion of, of visual metaphor built into your list. And so now you've got a list that has become visually complemented by metaphor or other types of imagery to make the point. And so listen to understand in the center, and there's an ear, and so the ear represents listening. Or slow down, and you've got a snail. So you begin to create pictures that sort of capture, that capture the essence of that principle. And so you can do a list, and sometimes you can go a little, little bit more creative and create visuals to complement the actual list of items. Here's one of my... Um, favorite models, and some of you may be familiar with this. This is an awesome model that's used a lot of times in strategic planning. And this is uh, what you might call an in, internal systems model for an organization. And Mackenzie created the 7S model. 
And you can see it's got the Venn diagram kind of elements to it uh, to some degree. And you can see the lines are representing what they call a Venn diagram or not what they call a Venn diagram, but the lines represent connections between the different concepts like a Venn diagram. And what you can see is if you notice that the top three structure, strategy, structure, and systems. And again, I want to uh, cue you all. What questions do you have? What, what reflections are you having? How is this relating to your model? Try some stuff out. Say, ask some questions so that I can help you. So we'll drop into some questions in just a, uh, a minute or two. So what you can see here is there's a few things happening all at once. First, they did their buckets, content. They started working on these things that fit into strategy structure, and they might have just started dropping concepts into those six areas. And they started thinking, okay, six areas, dropping them in. They might have at eight, they might have been just working on a bunch of concepts on the wall with post-it notes. And all of a sudden they start bucketing them. And then they start bucketing them, and then they say, what do we call them? Now they used the S's to help them create a model that was memorable. And that's why a lot of times we create the DIET, a diet for action research, or a plan for project management, P-L-A-N, or the 7S. We do it to help, again, going back to that principle, we have a concept, we need to make it accessible so people can use it, so then it can be duplicated with others, and they can teach others, and we can build a community of practice. So if you think about that, your idea to make it accessible means it's understandable, and then for it to be useful and duplicated, it means it needs to be memorable, and so they can remember it and share it with others. And using these types of acronyms and other kinds of things helps make that happen. Now, but look here, I don't know if you notice a few things happening all in one picture. The first thing is you've got these seven elements, and they, and they describe these seven elements as all relating to one concept. So if you think about the Venn diagram, they all overlap, and at the center, they're calling it shared values. Sometimes they call it mission of the organization, strategy of the organization, and all of these things need to support the strategy of the organization. Now, you got strategy on the left, and that's where there's been some challenge with the model. Uh, people have said, you know, that's where they kind of forced strategy over here, and that's why they called it shared values in the center. But you'll see some different talk about ways that they've separated that out. But essentially, they call it shared values. And so that's at the center. And that's and they have their own definition of that. And that's where we talked about the verbal persuasion element, how we define and describe things. So we describe the shared values. And then and a lot of times they would talk about that being about mission and, and, and sometimes the core values. And these all overlap to create the shared values. Now, what you also notice is that they are all connected to each other. So they're making a point that all of these things operate. And so if you move one, it creates tension or creates influence on the other ones around it. So as you move any of the circles, it impacts the others. That's the import, That's the point they're making with the strings or the, attach, the, the strings or lines attaching them. And then the next thing is, notice that the upper three, strategy, structure, and systems, is a different color than the lower three, skills, staff, and style. Can you tell the difference just from looking at it? Strategy, structure, systems, as opposed to skills, staff, and style. You can think of one being organizationally oriented, one being people oriented, and the values are what connects the two. So you can see different intentions behind what they're trying to say. And if you were teaching this, this would enable the teacher to say, we got to focus on these upper three, these lower three in a different way, uh, these upper three in a different way, and in the center, this is what we got to start with. And then these things have to all be, the seven S's have to be addressed to support the shared values. So questions. John, are there any questions out there? What questions do you have? I think Jeremy is here, if Jeremy wants to chime in. Jeremy is also with John looking at the chat room. And welcome, Jeremy, if you're out there. I think I saw you. Um, any questions, comments? There aren't any questions. Um, there haven't been any takers on the previous question either. Okay. So I'm going to pause. And just so I can, uh, for me personally, I can't see you all out there. So if you all could take a minute and go to the chat room and just give me a quick reaction. Uh, what are you taking away from this so far? What's helpful to you? Um, is this on track? Is this, what's, what, what is giving you something to think about? 
um, just give me a little encouragement or a little bit of feedback to know that I'm on track uh, where I might need to go to be helpful to you as I continue to proceed. So I'd appreciate it if you all could do that. And I'll move on to the next thing. And John, I'll pop back to you in just a minute. So take a minute if you all could out there and do that. And maybe I'll pause. And John, if you could elaborate, what are you taking away from what I've shared so far? And Jeremy, if you're out there, what are you taking away? Yeah, one is the importance of arrows, um, defining the relationships. But uh, I also like the one where including a visual metaphor to take a content model to the next level. Um, I think that's very important, and it's also it's also very difficult uh, sometimes to be able to do that. And uh, maybe talk a little bit about what it takes to design that type of metaphor into your model. I mean, does it take a lot of work? Does it take a lot of time? I know I don't always feel confident in my abilities to to represent something visually in terms of drawing or in terms of taking graphics and things like that. So. Maybe some thoughts around best practices for for, for building or designing um, metaphors within your models. Okay, yeah, and I think that the best, what I find the best way to do that, John, is through teaching others. So if you, if, again, I'm going to repeat this over and over again, that you have a concept that you, a model, a framework, methodology, approach. You tr make that accessible, and accessible means other people can understand what you're communicating. And I've, as I've said all along, you can have a great idea that's unaccessible to others, and so they can't evaluate how good it is. You may have a great idea that just gets thrown away because it's not accessible. So accessible is about making sure your idea is understandable to others so they can freely choose to interact with it and adopt it and utilize it. The next thing is utilizing it, meaning that they can use it to do something to help them. And the next thing is, can they teach others? And the next thing is, can a community of practice be formed around it so that it becomes scalable and used widely? And so in all of that, start using your approach and describing it to others and working on metaphors, working on different ways to express it, trying some different metaphors, frameworks, visuals out so you can see what works with people. And a lot of times people will react to what you share with them and they'll give it to you. So it'll be a gift back to you as you listen to how people interact with it. The bottom line is, is when you share it and all of a sudden it clicks and you see people kind of, um, you know, viscerally going back to this notion of uh, the physiological arousal piece, when you see people kind of go, ah, you know, you see an emotion, you see pain or play, you see something happen, then you know you've got their attention. Yeah. And so... And so it's really about testing it out and experimenting and testing and experimenting and teaching and writing and teaching and writing and experimenting and back and forth. And, and the idea is that you want people, you, you want to write it so people can understand it. But when you're in practice with it, can you use it in, you know, by the water cooler or in a session or with a client in a way that when you say poter, they don't go, ugh, I hate that. When you say plan, they go, OK, I like it. It helps me. I make sense. It fits. I like using it. So. It's really, you just got to keep, it's experimentation, I think, is the best way. And it's an art of learning how to do it. So um, and cool. anybody out there in chat land encouraging me to keep going or have any comments out there? Yeah, there are. And what you just said, the feedback about putting it out in front of people and testing it and trying it. Rosalind said that she's in the process. Uh, she's processing the information right now and thinking about how to apply that with what she's learning um, to a model that she's beginning to develop. So I think that that feedback will apply to her. Um, Anita said that she likes to focus on color to show different intention. That's what makes some visuals more user-friendly, um, but was never explicit about it. There's a couple questions I'm going to come back to, and we'll do those one at a time. Katie said she likes how structure and color can be used as a quick reminder for people who are familiar with the model. Uh, Deb said she's fine. This is great. Sherry said, um, do you ever give thought to the shape of your visual? That's one question. Yeah, I think I think the shape really gets at that notion of of metaphor, you know, like a ship plows the sea. And if you have a shape that looks like it's plowing to make a point within a, a model or if circles kind of represent uh, a community or connection versus squares. Why use squares? Uh, why use circles for the 7S as opposed to squares? Why not use ovals? Why not use stars? And I, again, think it's, it's really going back to that original question about intention and purpose. It's, you know, you use what's most 
uh, what I would say palatable on the mind's on the uh, the the mind's tongue and the eye and the mind's eye. You know what what really lends itself, and sometimes it serves a very specific purpose. You can describe it, and a circle makes perfect sense as opposed to a square, as opposed to a oval or a rectangle or something along those lines, like you see up here in these. It just it just depends on what you're you know what you're trying to convey and and um if it doesn't matter you might then want to experiment with what most people react positively to and try different versions and ask people to look at it and say what do you like what what is and why and you might end up finding a person says something this has happened a lot of times draw a model have a couple versions show it to somebody they react and tell you something you never thought of and you think wow i just added another dimension to this model i never thought of so those are some good things. And if anybody, I'm looking at the, uh, John, if you can look in the attendees list, I'd like to bring somebody in live who has a question or has something they'd like some live coaching on or some help with, or has a, who's willing to maybe share with us their reactions uh, live with us um, um, audio wise. If they could yeah, they uh, raise their hand, just you let them know and bring them in for me to talk with me. Yeah, so there are some outstanding questions. If yours hasn't been answered and you'd like to ask it live, or if you have a new one for a live question, first hand I see, I will unclip your mic. Okay, that sounds great. So I'm going to go back to the slides over here. There are a couple other questions in there, though, Steve. Sure. Uh, Justin said, what about combining the metaphor with the arrows? Absolutely. So, you know, you kind of think uh, back up here, is it possible that these – all these concepts, you could argue or make a suggestion that each of these visuals, and maybe they could, some of them are metaphors, some aren't, maybe they flowed and you need to start with one and go to the next and go to the next and go to the next. In this case, there is no sequence. They're all equally important. So there is, you get a sense when you look at this that there really is no one important over the other. You might argue that the most important one is have fun because it's on the top, but not necessarily. And so you could organize something like this in a way that could flow. And if you did, maybe it becomes a stream. And maybe the stream, and you see it flowing, and, and you have parts along it, and you have metaphors built into the stream, and so forth. So you can do it that way. What else, John? Uh, just to let you know, I unmuted Justin, so he's in the room, and he raised his hand. Is just Justin, you said? Hey, Justin, are you there? Okay, we'll keep going. And if Justin unmutes himself or uses, yep. uh, you might have to use a headset or a phone or something along those lines to call in. So let's keep okay. keep cruising. Another another model, and you can just interrupt me. I'm totally cool with that. Another model that I recently just threw in today was to talk about how about instructive models that really support the the big model that you're using. So in this case. Um, I'm curious if anybody, uh, anybody out there under, knows what this particular model, which is actually a floor plan, what is it representing? What methodology is it communicating? Anybody out there in chat land know what this one is? John, anybody? Nope, not yet. Maybe give them a second. So this... This, for everybody out there, is open space. And it, and it begins to start communicating the design of the room, the space uh, for the inner circle, the size of the room, and so forth. And a lot of times you can begin to create these models that are really instructive in nature. You know, here's another one that's, that's, that's instructive. When you look at the room, you can see how it's set up. You can see stuff on the wall. You can see, and if you could read, I believe this is Chinese. If you can read, you can probably see, you know, see the different walls talking about different things that are discussed. You can see the paper in the center, again, open space, markers on the floor. People are able to go up and talk. You see people talking to each other. You can see a table with some snacks. And so you can see all of a sudden in this model, it's telling you about open space, showing you what, what it looks like, and it's instructing you at the same time. Any more questions, John?
Yeah, there are a couple other ones. Um, Deb said, how about the use of animation? Uh, when you get into that, she's seen more animation to denote movement, um, as well as sounds in models these days. Yep, that's the whole new world. You know, i got to build that in a little bit more into this presentation. But for those of you out there, if you look up infographics and interactive infographics and gamification and infographics. So for those of you that are out there, the whole world is moving to all digital. And as we move to digital, ex digital uh, technology to express our ideas, we can then start creating infographics in which people can click and up pops a little phrase, and, and they can click and explore a concept. Um, there's a one out there where you can go look at the Roman Colosseum, and you have your iPad, and if you look this up, it's really cool. And what you can do is you're looking through a window in your iPad, and through the window, you're looking at the Colosseum. And as you tilt your iPad up, you're looking at the top, you look to the right, you can literally turn around and see what's behind you. You can then click a view and see the Colosseum today or the Colosseum of what it looked like, and you can begin to go look around. So can you imagine having a 3D visual model that you could walk around and look at almost? You can click on things with definitions popping up and um, or further Q&A questions. They're even starting to create the visual so you can click on something and ask a question, and people can discuss elements of a model within the concept of what you're doing. So all of that's coming. So these infographics, which if you look those up, they're static. Infographics are static, where they've got lots of information well presented. And then there's interactive infographics. And then there are um, even further gamified infographics, where you actually are doing things in the graphic, learning little pieces, and better understanding the interrelationships among concepts. I think I might need to create a whole another piece to the visual that really focuses on that interactivity piece as a whole different session because I could spend a whole hour on that alone. So if you all are yeah, interested in that, I could do that as well. That could be part 3C. Thanks. Yeah, John? Yeah, sorry. Something about like 21st century, 21st century model building. And uh, I mean, you can even talk about that video game called Minecraft where people are able to create and build entirely new worlds digitally and right. uh, it acts on like brain development and decision making and things like that. Right. Um, Dutch, Dutch has talked about all, all of those things in the chat room. Um, he's talked about the infographics as well as the gamification. He also says uh, one topic suggestion could be the role and function of metaphor in, construct, in constructing models. Yep, and we're going to talk about this in just a second. I totally uh, agree with that. And um, so those are some really great questions and brought up some stuff for you all out there to search on. And if you search on, again, the infographics, if you do a Google search, you'll see all kinds of great examples out there. I think I'll do a whole session just on that as well. So there's yeah, also so a hierarchy. John, did you have something you want to say? A couple more things. So far, Deb and Anita both um, responded to that about having that as a separate discussion. Um, John Kelly said that it reminds him of information mapping in the Sibet Group graphics course. And then Rajan said that it's a good recap of the basics of model building, uh, doing good so far. Great. Great, thanks. And so then you may have a concept, and the concept may have sub-concepts. And so if you look over on the right, artifact, and then you have motor vehicle, and then you have motor car, go-kart, truck, you could have you know multiple uh, sub-elements of something that aren't necessarily hierarchical. So nested is hierarchical, where there's a power difference or something has to report to the other and so forth. So there is some type of, uh, of, of power flow, if you will. And, and the other is just groupings and subgroupings. So one is nested, one is non-nested. And you can look up in dichotomous.com. I think it's a really nice site that has talked about a variety of things around model building that I liked. And they had this, this little example here about nested and non-nested that I um, really appreciated when they were talking about it in there. And so again, if you have a concept that has sub-concepts, it's almost like a mind map on the right. The non-nested is like a mind map, whereas on the left, it's more of a hierarchy that has power differential between each one, and one reports to the next, or one is dependent upon the next. So that's, again, as you look at intention, is the concept you're trying to communicate dependent, or is it 
groups and subgroups you, that you can decide how to represent it that way. Gutman scales are really powerful, and I, I, um, um, this comes, this right here is a model that's out there around paradigm change and how to change the paradigm in organizations. And a Gutman scale means that you can't go up to the upper level without the bottom, the lower level being met or addressed first. So most of you are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where you have a lower level need must be met in order to move to a higher level need. And, and in here, with Gutman scale, this, this one here is about paradigm change. If you want to change and create a paradigm shift in an organization, what was required is a change to the formal mission and strategy. Well, in order to change a formal mission and strategy and really have that actually stick and, and lead to the paradigm change, there needs to be a cultural change. In order for the cultural change to happen, there needs to be core processes. So you can't change culture without core processes. You can't change mission and strategy. You can change it on the wall and just change the writing. But if you really want to create paradigm change of mission and strategy and move up to that, you've got to have organizational culture change. You've got to then change the mission and strategy, which then leads to a paradigm shift in organizations. So sometimes this notion of hierarchy might be important for you in a model that you're creating. Any questions, John? None so far. Okay. So let's look at diagnostic models. Now, this is getting a little bit more advanced. So I love situational leadership. So now you're taking a whole bunch of stuff and putting them into a a model. So you're taking a variety of different models and flowing it into this. So for example, you've got four system states. You've got two dimension, task behavior and relationship behavior. So when a leader exhibits high relationship behavior and high task behavior, they call it a selling style. This is from Percy Blanchard. If you have a high task emphasis as a leader and very low relationship emphasis, you have a telling style. And if you have no relationship emphasis and no task emphasis, you've got a delegating style. If you have a high relationship and a low task, you've got a participating style. So you've got these different quadrants and based on two dimensions, relationship and task. So what they did was they took those two dimensions, put them together in a table, then created a two by two. You'll oftentimes find people creating two by twos all over the place that really get at four different system states in this model. And then on top of that, they say, okay, now let's try to get something diagnostic and, and intervention oriented. So then you go down below and you talk about the maturity level of the followers. And if you have a low maturity level to a high maturity level, low maturity levels are one, high maturity levels are four. And then you, in your writing and in all your words, you're gonna be defining all of these elements. Then you gotta describe how to use this model and how everything interacts within the context of using it and so forth. So that's where the real art comes. If you create a model like this, you could spend a whole book just describing this model that people will find very helpful once they, once they follow this and, and, and utilize this model uh, in practice. So if you have an R1, draw a line straight up from R1. It hits telling. Draw a line straight up from R2. It hits selling. R3, participating. R4, delegating. So what the model says is if you have a low maturity follower or team, you need to go to a telling style, which is high task, low relationship em emphasis. And then all the way over to high maturity, which is delegating. You can delegate to them. And there's certain rules about how you apply it, how you move people along this model. But as you can see, there's a flow. There is system states. There, you know, there is dimensions. There's like the, in the Venn diagram principles, and then you can see the diagnostic nature and the instructive nature all built into one. So I took that concept and I wrote an article called Situational Evaluation. And I took that and tried to say, how can I use that model to help me um, figure out how to help people determine what type of evaluation to, to utilize in a particular situation? And so one on the left side there, I talked about time and money versus improve and improve. That is that the more we got to improve and improve our, our interventions and prove that our interventions work, the more we have to 
improve them and prove that they work, the more time and money is required. So that's a simple model. So I'm showing the relationship between two concepts and an increasing model. There's a, a, a good model called the tipping point that's used. That's a book by, um, I'm forgetting his name right now. I'm seeing his face, his big hair, and he's written uh, Blink and a few others. And in the tipping point, he describes how he uses the same model to describe as people participate and get engaged in crowdsourcing around a concept. It hits a point in which the, the, the utilization and the brand awareness of the product just tips and it becomes a huge fad, a huge, a huge brand that everybody adopts and likes. Now, so I use that same concept to kind of help re describe the relationship between time and money and prove and prove. Now with that, I then said, okay, how can I use a situational leadership model to help me kind of make the point between using a comprehensive evaluation versus a dynamic, precise, or crude? Now I couldn't use this, the little curve like I did before, but then I talked about at the bottom there, you can see it's kind of small print. The degree to which you need to improve the intervention, prove the intervention, the time available, and the money um, of uh, allocation for the project. So if you have low, low need to improve it, low need to prove it, little bit of time, and little bit of money, you need to use a crude evaluation. If you have a moderate amount of all of them, then you can use a little bit more of a precise evaluation. If you have high, high on improve, improve, and moderate amounts of time and money, you can use a dynamic. And if you have a lot of time, a lot of money, you need to improve it, you need to prove it, it's all high, you need to use a more comprehensive evaluation. And so I talk about, then I, in, the, in the article, I describe the different types of evaluation tools that you can use to effectively have a crude evaluation that still is useful, or a more precise one, or a more dynamic one, or a more comprehensive one. So, and I talk about scope and rigor and so forth. And so when you talk about the whole organization in terms of scope, and a high amount of rigor, that's where you get to comprehensive. Questions, John? Because we're getting close to wrapping up. Yeah, there, well, there's some great discussion out here. Um, Dutch had a question if two by two was also known as the Latin square. Um, then people responded to Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, Malcolm the, Gladwell with the tipping point. Yep, and then Dutch also said within the tipping point, is the law of the few, and he says he uses that often in uh, social social networking. So I think the only outstanding question is, could you say more about the two by two model, and if that's also known as a Latin square, or if they are different terms? Yeah, I think so. And just two by two Latin square, um, and it's just this nice model for taking two dimensions, like I had here. You know, I could have taken this notion of time and money, improve and disprove, and I could take that and turn it into four squares and name the four quadrants, which are called system states. So you could draw a line, make the time and money, improve, and improve, turn it into four squares, a two by two, and then I would could name, if it's a lot of time and money and a lot of improve and improve, what would I call that? And then I would name the four squares as system states. I didn't do it here because my intention was to show the increasing nature or need for time and money as you need to improve, improve. That was all I was trying to do. So there was no need to create a two by two on that one. It was really about showing the, 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 the correlational relationship, if you will, between the two concepts conceptually, as opposed to over on the right, to having, having four types of evaluation from crude to comprehensive and describing those four kinds as different evaluation strategies when you want to evaluate the impact of interventions in organizations. So there's also predictive models, and I'm going to go five more minutes for you all out there looking at your watches. I'm going to go five Maybe. more minutes. Yeah, John? One more request from Anita. She's wondering if you could go back to the situational leadership slide for just three seconds. If you go and do a Google search on situational leadership in Hershey Blanchard, you'll get plenty of this. There's articles written. There's videos on how it is applied on YouTube. It's, a, it's an incredibly popular and well-known book. It's grounded in the one-minute manager that uh, uh, Hershey and Blanchard, Ken Blanchard created. So those are some tips for you to go out and find that as well. And so predictive models, this is where 
you want to get at a couple things. And first is a dependent model, a dependent variable moves because of the previous variables. So as, as, um, as we eat more, weight goes up. You know, as we eat less, weight goes down. So the notion of predictive models is this notion of positive negative relationship. The positive relationship means as the independent variable moves up or down, the mediating and the dependent variable move in a direction up or down pending the movement of that independent variable. But it's independent of the mediating and the dependent variable. Those two variables depend on the independent variable. And the mediating variable is really a dependent variable with the independent variable. But the minute you create a three-stage set of variables, independent to dependent, and put something in between, and one can move up, the other can move down, and the other can move up, you're trying to show how these three things have a chain reaction with each other, and it's predictive, and that there's a positive or negative direction. Now, you can show a reciprocal relationship such that the independent variable influences the, the reciprocal variable, and it in turn influences the independent variable. You can show a moderating variable, which based on what it does. So if I say, if I just take the mediating variable is eating and the dependent variable is weight gain or weight, and the moderating variable is exercise. So yes or no. So if I eat a lot, I gain weight. However, it's moderated by exercise. You could say type of food. You could say eating a lot of food, but you could say low fat, high vegetables and so forth will impact type of food, will impact eating a lot of the amount of food eaten and its impact on weight gain is moderated by exercise and type of food, for example. So predictive models really try to show this positive negative relationship and how as, as one variable moves in one direction, uh, the resulting variable, i.e. the dependent variable, moves in a different direction. And I am going to, I, I'm going to have to probably do this, this whole session in two parts next time, because going through this right here, we could spend a lot of time, but again, this, you can, if you just take some notes of these types of things, you can do a little bit of research around them. But what you want to know is that you're building your model and you're building these predictive models. You have units, you have laws of interaction, you have boundaries, you have system states that I've been talking about, propositions, hypothesis addresses, you know, as a variable moves, as an independent variable, IV moves in one direction, the DV moves in another direction. If they move together, that's positive. If they move in opposite direction, that's a negative relationship. And then you have empirical indicators, which is can you measure which elements of your model can you measure? So and we talked about there's using arrows here in the models. You got the process is arrows help to show a relationship and outcomes can be used. Arrows can be used to show how one thing leads to the next, an independent variable leading to a dependent variable. Now, correlation causation, that is important in the sense that sometimes you can have two variables connected to each other but you don't, can't say one causes the other. Causation says one happens first and this, the other happens second, and that's where you get at this notion of positive and negative arrowed relationships as opposed to positive and negative non-arrowed relationships. So correlations are non-arrowed relationships, causation are arrowed relationships. And then we talked about content models like Venn diagrams and process models like predictive models and flow charts and so forth. And here are a couple examples here, process models, steps, or a flow from the top down to the bottom. You got appreciative inquiry is another kind of flow in which you got a little bit of a Venn diagram aspect to it, saying that you 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 have your you've got your four elements, you have your discovery dream, design, and destiny, they flow around each other, all connected by an affirmative topic. Very simple. You got your ability to compare and contrast ideas, such as a seesaw, and showing the weight, and you can just kind of, like here, just a, it's a simple model to help you do that. You can put your text in. You got comparison diagram, that's a flow chart, like stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. 
You've got visual metaphors, which somebody mentioned, and I'll just touch on this. I, I would love to spend more time, so I'm going to make sure I wrap up for everybody out there and not go too fast. But uh, I like this notion of what's the difference between a metaphor and a simile. You're a weasel. Well, I'm like one. And the metaphor is you're a weasel. And the simile is, well, I'm like one. And this whole notion is here, when you talk about visual metaphors, it moves a picture's worth a thousand words, a metaphor's worth a thousand pictures. Well, how about a visual metaphor? What is it worth? And so you can kind of see like three ways to paint the future. Uh, I, this one here, you know, um, the, you know, the whole notion of you stab me in the back, that's a verbal metaphor. And then you got this cartoon here with the guy sitting there talking to the doctor and he's got a knife in his back and the doctor says, good news, the test results show it's a metaphor. And uh, so you can have a metaphor on the left to make a point. You can have one on the right to be instructive. And so the visual metaphor can be used to help you think about the instructions you're about to give, three ways to paint the future. You can have show comparisons like apples and oranges. And so I'm going to stop there. I think I have one last thing to talk about. If there are any questions, Sean, before we, I show one last slide and then we wrap up. No questions, John? Nope, I would just show the last slide and, and I'll ask again and see if there's any more questions. Okay, so as we wrap up, um, just for time's sake, if you all could, would you would you put down the one most helpful point in the session today for you? Uh, the one takeaway that you found most useful? It could be more than one, but what did you find useful, helpful, enlightening, uh, something new that you hadn't thought about uh, so that I can kind of know what in this presentation is helpful to others. I'm gonna be doing this again. I'm, I'm still working on how to share this content. So I'd really love to know what you find helpful to you and what your takeaways are. So if you could in the chat room, share that. And the last thing is a meta model. A lot of times you're gonna create a main model and then weave it together with all your, all your sub models, you're gonna weave them together into one meta model. And notice the wet metaphor here of weaving that I use, just in just saying a meta model, weaving it all together. And what you're seeing here is a picture where I have, I'm working on a principles of management book where the students are working on situations. So you see down at the bottom, and the situations are comprised of challenges. And we're using gamification in this book. And the students will get faced with a situation or a challenge and see the Gutman scale no notion here. They get the situation and challenges and they use tools and theories through the manager's application process, which I call DIET, Diagnose, Intervene, Evaluate, and Transfer. And so the students use the tools and the theories to diagnose the situation and the challenge, determine the intervention, evaluate the impact of that intervention, and transfer the, the knowledge and learning from that intervention into their own life and profession and work. As a result, they're able to create a solution. So the focus is on creating a solution based on the tools and the theories through the diet. And on the left, I talked about Bloom's taxonomy and that as that lowered levels of learning outcomes are met as they face the situation. And as they move up Bloom's taxonomy, they move towards more application to solutions. I also talked about how it's, it's also, we can use the book to help them move from their passion to their profession. And so this is a model I'm working on. But this again, as you can see, is I'm using a Gutman scale. I'm using some notions of Venn diagrams. I'm using the two S of situations and solutions, the manager's application process. You notice it says map, that was by accident. But when I say map, I'm now gonna play on the notion how you can map, you can, as a manager, how you can map out your, uh, your solutions to situations that you face. And situations can be both problems and possibilities. And so, and map out your approach and so forth. So I'm playing with that. So that's just an example of, of taking and creating a meta model, bringing the various concepts together. So we're done. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, any final comments, John, questions as we say goodbye? Yep, there's several final comments. Um, Rosalind said that her key takeaway was being able to discern all the different kinds of models. Uh, Dutch drivers was interactive infographics and lucid charts. 
Uh, Deb said she liked reviewing the types, the meta model, instructive, diagnostic, intention versus purpose. Uh, great job. Please uh, do the infographics in the future. Um, Jeff DeWolf said tying together images and shapes to logically support the purpose of the model was a key takeaway. Uh, Rosalind, maybe in a future session, would like to hear your process for deciding which models you use to create this presentation. Um, Rock said the use of metaphor and model building and creating a story was a key takeaway, and thanks for sharing. And Anita said thanks for sharing and not waiting till you have it all down. Uh, she likes your thinking on where you're going with the, the model you just sent out there. Yeah, great. And my last and final piece of advice to everybody out there, just get started. The presentation I'm doing today, in my mind, is rough, and I'm still figuring it out, and I'm getting it out there. And so as I do it it's this time, I'll do it again, I'll do it more, and eventually I'll be able to hit these three Vs and this process for model building into a nice, easy, quick to understand process. So thank you all for being a part of it and being a part of my model building process on model building. And John, thanks for watching the chat room and I'll see you all very soon as we have uh, future webinars. We'll be going to part four and we'll be sending invitations to that and others. Take care for now and have a great rest of the day.